Hi, everybody. I am a, a scout, and um, I wanted, I'm the director of the network for LGBT health equity. We actually, as you can probably see on the screen there, we are federally funded, and we are out of CDC, and we usually provide services to people working in the tobacco control arena, but that just means that we end up um, actually providing a lot of trainings to people at state health departments and public health officials all around the country. So um, we're very excited to be here with the National Health Service Corps. You know, you, you provide an invaluable service to especially all of the um, you know, medically underserved communities around the country, and we're very very enthusiastic about the opportunity to get a chance to make sure that LGBT people are also um, uh, a part of your uh, breadth of experience and welcome populations among who you serve. And with that, I'd also like to introduce my co-presenter, the director of the, net, uh, the uh, National LGBT Cancer Network, Ms. Liz Margulies. Hi. Um, the National LGBT Cancer Network is a nonprofit based in New York City that addresses the needs of LGBT cancer survivors and those at risk. We do education of the LGBT community, train healthcare providers like we're doing here today, and advocate for LGBT inclusion in national cancer organizations, research, and the media. Back to you, Scott. Yeah, exactly. So between us, we've done a whole lot of uh, cultural competency trainings in a diff in a bunch of different arenas. So um, I will say, though, one of the challenging one ways to do it is through a webinar. Why? Because it's really hard to get a sense of where you stand. We can't really hear you very much, and I understand, you know, you have your phones on mute, everything like that. So first of all, if I can possibly set some ground rules here, um, Oh, wait a second, I guess I was supposed to cover what we are going to cover first. Then I'll go to ground rules, I guess. Um, I'll go over a little more detail of what we're going to cover, and then I'm going to set some ground rules. Um, we're going to first talk about why it is LGBT health right now is a much bigger issue in this country, and, and it probably always has been. It's finally getting some acknowledgement. Um, so we're going to talk about the policy changes that um, are really shifting the national arena right now. And then, you know, in every training we've been in, we have always had someone, at least, who didn't even understand the basic grounding of what LGBT means, which is great, because that means we're reaching the people who need to be reached. So we're going to start at the beginning here and give you a 101 of what's going on there and start from that and start to move forward. And then uh, Liz is going to go through a review of a lot of the information on health disparities so that you can kind of get a sense of why it is there's some differential uh, things you should be considering when you look at this po these populations. And then we're going to talk about what you need to do, uh, also access to care disparities as well, too. Then we're going to really dig into strategies and what you can do at a bunch of different levels. We uh, asked in advance what the profile was of the people here, and it looks like it's about an even mix of um, uh, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, um, physician assistants, a few dentists, and a lot of different uh, psychotherapists, mental health professionals at a, at a few different levels. So we've got a wide variety of people who could be on the phone right now. We want to make sure we give each of you strategies that you can use in your day-to-day -day environment. And then, of course, we're going to give you some resources as well. So that's kind of a, a, another summary of what we're going to run through here in this hour and a half. And with that, now I'll go to the ground rules. You know, we're professional trainers. This is your safe space to ask whatever kind of questions you'd like. It's a little harder in the webinar because we're kind of, you know, taught to be silent. We encourage you to please use the question and answer section in the right of your webinar screen to just type in questions as we're going along at any point. And we will also, if you'd like verbally asking questions, it would be great. We will also pause after every other module, modules two, four, and six, and open the lines for people to ask questions. When you do, if I can ask um, Doris, I believe is our operator, it's star two, you say, in order to, or star one? It's star one. Star one, sorry. So if you have a question, it's star one. Then you'll be connected to Doris, the operator, and she will queue you up so that you can have a live line and ask the question with everybody. So questions are what we love. Please don't hold back because, of course, we'd much rather you ask them here than, um, than still be wondering about them in a clinical environment. Now, we're going to go kind of quickly on this, so please also type in if we're going too fast or if we've, uh, gosh, we've been used an acronym you don't understand, all that sort of stuff. So basically, please, I'd like to just convey 
um, let's try and make this as much of a two-way street as we can, considering it's a webinar. All right? And with that, let's just lead directly into uh, what's changing at the national level that's really bringing more of a spotlight onto the issues of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender health right now. Um, and and you know, let me also say that long ago when I was first brought in the arena, I thought to myself, um, well, actually, I asked my mentor, why in the world could this be different? I mean, you know, we have the same biological, goal, you know, underpinnings as everybody else. But, of course, now we know that a majority of our health outcomes, particularly our bad health outcomes, are actually more socially determined than biologically determined, which, of course, explains why it is that there is a, a, a constellation of issues around lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender health disparities. And they've been recently, nicely, been gaining a fair amount of attention at the federal level. It's a little bit overdue, but we're happy it's there. Um, many of you probably, I would hope, have heard that um, it was just another in a long series of uh, examples like this that sadly in Florida a year plus ago, uh, two lesbians um, were faced with a situation where one of them sadly needed to go into the emergency room and was faced with a life or death situation and the people in the emergency room forbid her lover from, and her kids from seeing her simply because they did not have designation as legal next of kin. And as a result, sadly, that person died without being able to see her lover or her kids again. And uh, this wasn't the first time it happened, but luckily this time it reached the right ear. And in response, uh, Obama had put together the LGBT hospital visitation memo, which came out last spring, mandated Medicaid recipients, which of course means most of most healthcare institutions, to allow LGBT family visitation in uh, emergency situations. And, you know, I will say, just to, to make this real straight off the bat, I sadly was in a position where I was watching my lover face the exact same, my mother's, I'm sorry, my mother face the exact same uh, situation with her lover only two weeks ago. She's a lesbian. She has a lesbian partner who about two or three weeks ago faced the life for that situation. And sadly, I hate to say it, was facing end of life decisions and ultimately died. And I didn't even understand after this memo had gone through how far this still felt from really respecting people, how, how, how far short it fell. Because in the situation with my mother, I mean, if you can imagine the horror of here she is, she'd been engaged to this person forever, she's not legally allowed to marry, she's with us, you know, um, wasn't automatically next of kin. If she'd done disaster planning, she could have been next of kin. But that's a hard thing to get the average person to do, right? The disaster planning piece of their legal, you know, portfolio, right? And here she was faced with um, life or death decisions on her partner, and they were ignoring her in the emergency room in, um, in a hospital that, interestingly enough, felt that they were proud of their LGBT acceptance. They were letting my mother visit. That was not an issue. But they were going to someone else to ask about these lend of life decisions because that person had the legal status as next of kin. And they were ignoring the person who was this person's partner. So, you know, you actually realize that even though the Obama visitation memo was a huge advancement in this area, that kind of situation is a, is a lived tragedy that, that, you know, my mother, myself, everybody else involved will never forget. So we obviously don't want to even just avoid those kind of real horrible tragedy scenarios, but help you so that you can, you know, do the nuances of real accepting care as well. The other uh, point you see on there is that it's still controversial. For example, in Wisconsin, they're actually trying to fight this memo, and um, they're trying to, through the legal system, challenge it to make it so that they do not have to allow your partners to visit you, that it will only be legal next of kin, which um, so it just shows a little bit of the bellwether of political sentiment that it doesn't necessarily mean that even with this memo that these issues are not um, still being fought in a lot of uh, forums around the country. Another big advancement we've had recently is that the Joint Commission, um, which as many of you probably already know, is the, are the people who provide accreditation to almost all of the hospitals and many of the healthcare facilities around the country, has recently released um, a new report about cultural competency, and they include a lot more points in that report on LGBT cultural competency, including they ask you to create an environment that welcomes LGBT staff and patients. They have optional suggestions to uh, add sexual orientation and gender identity. That's what the SO slash GI there is for medical records. And a nice thing about this report, and I encourage you to look it up, 
and may I also note, as a matter of fact, we're going to mention a lot of studies and reports and things like that. We actually will be providing with a handout with all the references after the fact. So um, we haven't put the footnotes in here necessarily, but you're going to get that handout with all those footnotes for all the studies we cite, things like that. But one point about this is that this report is little known that as of July 1st went so far beyond the Obama memo because the Joint Commission as of July 1st instituted a new standard whereby in order to get new accreditation, all the facilities that they credit had to have LGBT non-discrimination in their policies. And this honestly could be a big sea change for LGBT health. So it's a little known fact, but um, it really is starting to change uh, the world that, that um, you know, unfortunately you'll see a little more later about how historically the discrimination has been very well accepted. So requiring non-discrimination policies is a big step. Another big landmark we've had just in the last year is that the federal government has their um, health planning document, and it gives them goals for what they want to do in health for the next decade. They just created a new one, Healthy People 2020. The overarching goal there is to achieve health equity and eliminate disparities. Now, people uh, in Healthy People 2010, a decade ago, sexual orientation was mentioned for the first time, not gender identity, but it was mentioned kind of buried in the text, and you literally had to find it. I actually helped write one of the companion documents and I still had to search to find where the sexual orientation information was. The nice part about Healthy People 2020 is because of the work of a lot of great people, now the goal of eliminating disparities related to sexual orientation and gender identity is now kind of painted on the side of the ship for Healthy People 2020. It is one of the primary goals you see on any summary of the document, and um, this is a new level of prioritization that we haven't had before. There's also uh, a new topic area for LG. LGBT health that is being fleshed out as part of the Healthy People 2020 um, objectives. Another big move we had recently is that the National Institutes of Health took a year. Um, well, they commissioned the Institute of Medicine, which you know is their external body, to give them the highest gold standard of scientific review, to review all the um, research on LGBT health. And it was, after a year of looking, they just released this report this last March. And so this provides, uh, you know, uh, the biggest to date overview of all of the existing information. And importantly, it also provided some pretty strong recommendations, including calling for routine data collection for sexual orientation and gender identity, recalling, uh, calling for cultural competency trainings at many, many different levels of the healthcare system, and calling for LGBT inclusion in research, even so far as to say that, um, for people familiar with NIH, they, they, they usually require you to say, if you haven't included communities of color, state why you've excluded them. They want LGBT, they ask for LGBT to be the same kind of designation. Please routinely include it or justify why you feel it should be excluded. So in general, I would have to say that I think we're actually probably at very much of a tipping point around LGBT health. Um, other steps are being taken at, at Department of Health and Human Services. There's a new cross-HHS task force on LGBT health. Uh, Secretary Sebelius, after a lot of advocacy work by many groups um, and, and the many people I know, just announced this last summer that she would be testing LGBT questions for the major health surveys. And um, she also now, after the Institute of Medicine report, put up an annual kind of plan, and this is part of the Obama memo too, an annual plan of what they're going to do in HHS to enhance LGBT health um, disparity work. So actually, I think I heard after the, I'm sorry, I just remember now, but after the last seminar, we heard that that is a dead link, so we're going to have to provide you with a new one. Apparently, they moved where their plan was, so pardon us that the government's kind of shuffling things around. I do know that she's been, uh, she has called people to D.C. to try and uh, outline what she's going to be doing for the plan for the coming year, so it's still an active uh, document that they're working on at many, many different levels of HHS. And you're going to see those types of things because you're going to see, um, you know, increased requirements for cultural competency and um, asking for LGBT health disparity plans and funding announcements, things like that are going to keep coming down. So, um, you know, we're, we're happy because it's certainly long overdue that the, the level of disparities is being acknowledged. And, you know, we're hoping that this really does make a big uh, start to shift the tipping point point, you know, in, in a lot of these things. One thing I'll also say, going back to that first document around um, the Obama memo, is they've actually also upped the requirements of the Obama, Obama memo just
just a few weeks ago, they also required and asked that um, hospitals be more active in designating um, a legal um, a legal, legal health care surrogate. And so that would mean when someone comes in in an emergency room or situation, that you actually ask them who their legal representative would be and put that down on paper. And, you know, I think to the issue related to my own mother, that's something where if that had been done earlier in the course of her lover being admitted to the hospital, that she would have been the one being consulted around those end-of-life decisions. So um, I'm really happy they made that additional enhancement and asked for that, and I'm really looking forward to when that actually is implemented all around the country. And with that, let me move on to LGBT 101. We're going to talk about some of the definitions here. And then just to remind you, at the end of this module, we're going to be stopping for questions. And the definitions are often kind of one of the thornier areas, so please, um, again, Please feel free to be the first one asking the question and, and, the, and the last one, too. Okay, so again, LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Um, many people might have some working familiarity with that acronym. LGB indicates sexual orientation, so that would be who you partner with, lesbian, gay, bisexual. Do you partner with, is it a woman partnering with a woman? If so, that's lesbian. A man partnering with a man, that's gay. Bisexual would be someone who partners with either a woman or a man at different points in their life, or is open to partnering with uh, different folks. So that's sexual orientation, who you partner with. The interesting thing about LGBT is that you also then include gender identity, which is the T or transgender. So gender identity is um, we really only allow kind of two uh, uh, sexes in our in our um, world, right? Male, female. You have one of those check boxes at birth, and you know from your birth certificate on, that's what you have. But gender is really how you construct and present your, you know, your knowledge, your awareness, your, your affiliation with one of those sexes, both of those sexes, neither of those sexes, or some completely different spectrum. But how you present being masculine, feminine, some combination thereof, things like that. And then, you know, people are familiar with the concept of gender role, gender role being what, uh, you know, uh, what aspects of that you take on in public uh, performance and presentation. But gender identity then being how you yourself identify as being either exactly affiliated with your sex at birth. So, you know, check, check male at birth and you're clearly male, not a question, what's the issue, right? Or maybe you actually don't particularly identify that with that. Maybe you were checked male at birth. Maybe you consider yourself to be maybe a blend of the two. Or maybe you actually realize that you really are female even though you might have a biologically male body or you're assigned male at birth. So gender identity is your own self-awareness of what it is, you, where you really identify on that spectrum. Um, let's see. So I actually already covered lesbian, gay, bisexual. We did a little bit about transgender, so let me dig into that a little bit more. Oh, and I missed the first one. I'm sorry. Sexual and gender minority. These are actually um, synonyms with LGBT uh, that are currently in pretty popular use at the federal arena. Um, so you're going to see SGM, sexual minority, and gender minority being used interchangeably with LGBT. And... Uh, it's kind of you know, what things are acceptable in different areas. There's not really much of a difference. Both of them are very neutral terms, not really very charged whatsoever. Um, so now to transgender. That's definitely one that people usually have a little less familiarity with. Um, like, for example, I am a transgender person, but I don't identify as some of the different types of transgender do I identify as other. So one of the common types of transgender is a transsexual. If you can envision um, a football field with, you know, a big male at one goal post and a female at the other, the transsexuals are the people where they might have been assigned one at birth, but they realize they're in the exact opposite end zone. So that means you might have been assigned female at birth, but you really are male. But there's no in-between about this whatsoever. The transsexuals are the ones with the exact opposite. Um, on the other hand, transgender, uh, you know, originally designated as the term that would be the umbrella, the overarching term for everything, um, also is used with kind of a small t to indicate someone who might possibly be somewhere in the middle of the football field a little bit more. 
For example, I was assigned female at birth, but actually identify as transgender, or another word that is um, not as frequently used as uh, gender queer. And so that means for me that I identify a little bit more in the middle of the football field, maybe at a 90-yard line, something like that, but it's not as clear just one or the other. One of the terms you heard me use in there, um, gender queer, and we certainly always get a lot of questions around the, the usage of the word queer. It, it happens kind of, it, it's, it's more commonly being used as a positive identity label, particularly with younger populations, and it doesn't hold the level of negative charge that you see with some of the other derogatory terms that have been used in the past for other uh, overlapping uh, racial minority groups. But with that kind of thing, I think that, uh, you know, where Liz and I usually stand would be that when you hear someone use a term in uh, a, a clinical setting, you want to be comfortable reacting to them, okay? And sometimes they're going to use a term on themselves, like, I'm genderqueer. And that might be something you think to yourself, I'm not going to say back. But we really want to make sure that you kind of walk away from this feeling, first of all, that you don't get paralyzed because you don't know. People can smell good intentions a mile away. They can smell bad intentions a mile away. It's more important not to be paralyzed, even if you're not exactly sure if you're going to make the perfect step. So in the cases of terminology, we'd really recommend just ask someone if it's a word or a usage that you're less familiar with. So you, you identify as gender queer, right? That's fine. Just ask them like that instead of avoiding it. Because if someone says to you something like, I'm gender queer, and you reply back with something like, you're a lesbian, that actually is changing what they just said to you in a way that you don't understand. You don't have to understand. But just tr practice echoing back the same way that they talk about themselves. And if you have any concerns about it, ask the question first to make sure you're completely comfortable with it. Um, but the most important thing is don't be afraid to use the verbiage that they talk about themselves. Um, queer is usually something that can be a general term for any of the groups, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, um, more commonly used by younger population, but not exclusively. Like, I actually grew up with queer, and I'm 45, so um, uh, that's, you know, migrating now, obviously. Gender queer is a little similar, more often has to do with someone who is not necessarily fixed in one of the two um, sexes, male, female. Um, and transgender, obviously talked about that, transsexual. Uh, another point around transsexuals, so these are the people who identify as the exact opposite goalpost, would be that people often ask, are they transsexual after they've had a surgery? And just to kind of, you know, quickly say it, that surgeries for, uh, let's say, for someone who's assigned male and really is a female, can cost upwards of $100,000. So, you know, maybe some of you have saved that much in your life, but I certainly actually haven't. So, obviously, waiting until someone's able to afford the surgery is really a socioeconomic issue, not an identity issue. So, it just kind of like helps you, us to see that we want to separate out how we respect someone's identity from whether they've been able to raise $100,000 or not. So, you know, if someone can be transsexual, and that does not necessarily mean that they should have had surgery, ever want to have surgery, can afford to have surgery. The same thing with hormones. So, you know, in this kind of a situation, you really just want to respect what someone presents as and not try and um, give them some kind of criteria before you're able to respect what they present as. And then the last, um, there's, there's a lot of other words that can be used um, for the population. You don't, I don't think you need to know all of them whatsoever. You just need to feel comfortable either using a word that someone gives you or what some of the general terms are, like sexual gender minority or LGBT. So... Just don't be worried about the other things that are thrown in there so much as just feel comfortable in diving in. Uh, the last term on here that I haven't said yet was intersex. And intersex um, is an interesting word. This would be what we had prior in historical times referred to as hermaphrodite, someone who genetically presented at birth or later because of, uh, uh, because of hormone issues as somehow being uh, a blend of what we think of as archetypical male or female. There's a million different genetic and chromosomal variations, hormonal variations, which not a million exactly, but there's a lot of them that can create someone who is somehow representing with, you know, there's like people who represent with a micro penis is one of the words they have, um, things like that. And, and 
the issues related to intersex people are not perfectly overlapping with lesbian, gay, by tra- and transgender, bisexual, transgender folks because those uh, issues often actually appear at birth instead of when you have your own identity awareness. They're often physical issues. There's often a surgeries involved, things like that. There's actually um, a, a lot of sad scenarios where people are forced into surgery, stuff like that. So while the populations are sometimes clumped together, um, they shouldn't automatically overlap. And uh, the issues related to the different populations are not automatically um, uh, disparities are not automatically shared by them. So while while I'm happy to explain what intersex is, the general content of our presentation doesn't necessarily cover the issues related to the intersex or um, disorders of gender uh, presentation. No, disorders of development. gender development. Thank you. I know I was missing the last D there. Population. That's another phrase used for the intersex population now. So with that, Liz, anything I've missed as far as phrasing or any questions around language and definitions? No, I think you did a great job. Anybody else questions? I don't see anything typed up there. Um, well, let me keep going because we're going to get to more questions at the end of this, but please think now. Um, feel free to ask those questions because if we don't have a couple around the definitions, then I was, I was uh, a little too extra clear. It would be unusual. Okay, people always ask in the trainings, how many people are LGBT in the country? You know, we don't ask the question on surveys, so we have uh, a marked lack of data. But we have a lot of smaller studies and or extrapolations and or da da da, all this sort of stuff that currently leave the best think tanks to estimate that there are 8.8 .8 million LGBT people in the United States, which is approximately the population of the state of North Carolina or actually the state of New Jersey. Um, LGBT people, you know, I once went out to Kansas and they're like, oh, we don't have LGBT people here, you know, as the rural people are brought in to have an LGBT training. They're like, but I don't have LGBT people. Yeah, you actually do. They're, they're, LGBT people are found in every congressional district in the United States. Actually, when I was in Kansas, I was able to show them, not only do you have them in every single one of your counties, but the, the percent of LGBT people in Kansas has actually grown by 200% in the last five years. And it's not that people are flocking to Kansas, but of course, as people feel a little more comfortable disclosing that they're LGBT, um, we're going to find the numbers go up around the country in surveys and things like that. Just FYI, the number, uh, you know, LGBT people emerge in every different racial, ethnic, socioeconomic category through all the historical time periods that we can think of in all sorts of different countries. This is not a phenomenon that is restricted to the United States or to this era or, or anything else. It just kind of looks like it's a true representation of the, uh, you know, the beauty of biodiversity in this in this world of ours. There's a whole bunch of three-leaf clovers, but every so often a four-leaf clover just keeps emerging, and that's um, kind of what is, has been going on with LGBT people throughout history. Um, so I ask here, is it legal to fire us? And this is something we usually do in in-person trainings. You know, we ask people, and I'll tell you uniformly the answer is, you know, a couple of people are like, uh, yeah, but most people are like, absolutely not. And I think one of the important things as a provider to know is that in the most of the United States, it is actually absolutely legal to fire someone for being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. It is also legal to kick them out of a restaurant. It's legal to kick them out of a hotel. It's legal to not rent an apartment to them. And it, it's actually legal to discriminate against them in education in, in many cases, as a matter of fact, in public schools. Us, not them. So on this map, you see all of the white states, it is legal to fire LGBT people or, you know, kick them out of apartment, things like that in any of those states. There's a couple uh, cities in those states where there are protections, but generally in the states, it's perfectly legal. In the pink states, oddly, they've protected only sexual orientation and not transgender, which, as you'll see later, since there's some crazy transgender health disparities and discrimination history, that's unusual. In the blue states, they have protected uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, but they, that doesn't necessarily mean they've even protected in the schools. So... The reason why I say this is because this is what the people coming to you are carrying as deep core knowledge in their lives. And it's part of what shapes their sense of whether or not it might be safe to come to your office. Okay, we are up to the first question and answer session. So I believe that Doris is there. And if you hit star one, we would love to hear from um, any of the people on the line.
Nikki, and if you'd like to ask a question, press star 1. There are no audio questions at this time. Uh, yeah, the quietness of people. I, I, I don't believe that I was actually that clear. So um, I'll tell you what, let's just please uh, feel free to put um, chat notes up or continue to ask questions because I know that the terminology alone can sometimes be pretty confusing. So I invite you to please uh, put them on the sidebar and um, we can come back to them as we go through everything else because, you know, we understand there's this... You know, you're on mute, but then, you know, we actually ask you to speak up. So there's that little bit of that oddity. Okay, with that, I'm going to um, right now then possibly turn it over to Liz, and she's going to run through some of the um, health disparity issues. How's that, Liz? Sounds good. I seem to, though, have trouble advancing the slide, so let's see how I do. I'm going to cover, cover some of the diseases, risk factors, and barriers to quality care that are experienced by LGBT people as a group, meaning they might not be true for every single individual. And the important thing to remember is that, as Scout said, there is no difference in the biology or physiology between LGBT bodies and others. These health concerns are a result of the social conditions under which LGBT live, people live, compared with the general population, meaning the stress and stigma of living as sexual and gender minorities leads to health risks. And it can be something subtle that's experienced every day at work, like hearing an anti-gay remark, or it can be extreme, like in hate crimes. And on that, a new study, which will be in your handout thing, found that LGB people, meaning they didn't include transgender people in this, LGB people who had experienced what they called prejudice-related major life events were three times more likely to have suffered a serious physical health problem over the following year than people who had not experienced these kinds of events. Oops, something. Hey. Get off. Sorry, I thought you couldn't advance and I made a mistake. I'm not sorry. <laughs> I'll be in charge. I'll tell you if I need you. Okay, no problem. Okay. And that this held true regardless of other factors like age, gender, employment, and even health history. So in general, as Scott said, there's just way too little data and little money for research on LGBT health. So some of what we know, and I'll be presenting here, is cobbled together from multiple small studies. And as it's relevant, I'll separate out the differences within the subpopulations, and most probably that'll be the transgender population. Now, let's see if I can move on. Okay, tobacco use. Tobacco use in this population has been studied for some time, and each study confirms the same thing. Our tobacco use is dramatically higher than the general population, up to twice the national rate. Why? Well, there are multiple reasons, but they include the fact that tobacco is often a coping strategy for dealing with stigma or harassment. Bars are one of the few social outlets for LGBT people to meet in some parts of the country, and some bars still even allow smoking. And the LGBT community has been directly targeted by the tobacco companies. Um, Transgender tobacco rates are exceptionally high. A full 30% of trans people smoke, which is 50% higher than the rate of the general population, I think. Trying. Um, alcohol and drug use. Here, too, we have a number of resources and research to pull information from, and they all report the same two things. Dramatically increased alcohol and drug use for all subpopulations of the LGBT community, and a phenomenon where alcohol use does not decrease with age like you see in the rest of the population. Again, this is partly a product of relying on bars for socialization and a reaction to the stress of stigma and discrimination. And the last statistic here is from a study that found that 25% of trans people misuse drugs or alcohol specifically to cope with discrimination or mistreatment. We have that study, don't we, Scout, for them to see? I think so. Yeah. That would be in the, I think all these are in the citation of things. Good. Um, cancer. The first two slides looked at health risks 
And now I want to turn our attention to a disease or a large class of diseases, cancer. My organization, the National LGBT Cancer Network, focuses on cancer, obviously, but it was not founded because we knew there was more cancer in LGBT people. Actually, no national surveys or cancer registries collect information on either sexual orientation or gender identity, which leaves us invisible within the data. So one of the previous slides looked at the high rate of tobacco use in LGBT people, but I can't tell you that we have higher lung cancer rates. I'm sure we do, but I don't have one study to put on the handout that says that. And this Liz, is if I could just go ahead, tell them about Paula, please. And oh, I'll now. get to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, this information, it's critical for us to have this um, for programming and for funding. Like, look how important it is that we know now that white women are more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer, but black women are more likely to die from it. Still, without having statistics, I estimate that there are about one million LGBT cancer survivors. And I identify as a lesbian, and I just had um, a leader of our community, Paula Edelbrick, who was a lawyer and ran multiple organizations. She just died of ovarian cancer, and she is actually my third friend to die of ovarian cancer. I have a friend with lung cancer. I have probably a dozen friends who um, had treatment for breast cancer but are all still alive. Let's look for a minute at breast cancer in lesbians as a particular little pocket here. We've put together a bunch of small studies and concluded that lesbians have, quote, the richest cluster of risk factors, unquote, because as a group, lesbians um, use more alcohol, use tobacco more, are less likely to have a biological child before age 30, which would offer some protective factor, and um, are more likely to have a high body mass index and eat a high fat diet, all of which contribute to the risk of breast cancer. Um, for gay men, I want to just use as an example anal cancer and the human papillomavirus. Anal HPV is present in approximately 65% of HIV negative gay men or men who have sex with men and 95% of men who have sex with men who are HIV positive. The rates of anal cancer, which is a very rare disease in the general population, is 40% higher in HIV positive gay men. And there are nearly no studies looking at cancer in transgender people. But Considering that many use hormones as part of their transition and that many times it is without a doctor's prescription and that wildly varying dosages and that hormones have been implicated in multiple types of cancer, I have a lot of concerns about how this is affecting the cancer rate among transgender men and women. Finally, another big cancer group is people with HIV and AIDS are living longer due to improved meds. Cancer is becoming one of the biggest problems in this population. I'm not referring to the AIDS-defining cancers, but others that have come to be known as AIDS-associated cancers, like lung, kidney, and anal cancer. And these cancers are all found at a much younger age in this population than you see in the general population, and the treatment is obviously more complicated because of the medication. Given these increased risks, we want LGBT people to be hypervigilant about screening, but no. All the studies show that as a group, LGBT people have lower cancer screening rates, fewer mammograms, fewer colonoscopies, everything. And going back to HPV and gay men, those men who have sex with men but are not out to their provider are unlikely to be screened for anal cancer with a very simple anal pap smear. Last, the higher incidence that I report here is from one study, the California Health Interview Study, which is a rare state that collects information on sexual orientation. Another small study confirmed higher rates, um, cancer rates for gay men. But these are small and we need, as I said, to have um, all cancer registries routinely collect information about sexual orientation and gender identity. And as for the experience of LGBT cancer survivors, there's a new study that found poorer survivorship experiences in lesbians and bisexual men, and another study found that gay men who had undergone treatment for prostate cancer reported a lower quality of life. Mental health. The information on this slide should 
come as no surprise given all that Scout and I have covered here today. Mental health problems are more prevalent in LGBT people. And recent information about bullying um, shows how early this discrimination begins for people who are gender nonconforming or lesbian or gay. Please note here the astronomically high rate of suicide attempts in transgender people. Um, and there's been some incredible new research, also in your handout, all in the last year on the effects of social policy on mental health in lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, meaning transgender people were left out of this study. And in states without protective policies, meaning bans on discrimination, LGBT people were nearly five times more likely to have mental health disorders. And even in those states that did have bans, mood disorders among LGBT people were still higher than the general population. Oops, there we go. Um, in the interest of time and wanting you to have plenty of time for questions, which I hope you'll take advantage of, I'm going to move on now. But I recommend that you look up information about these other LGBT health disparities, HIV, STI infections, heart disease and lesbians, bisexual women, bullying, domestic violence. Um, I just want you to know that what I covered here today is absolutely not an exhaustive list. I'm not sure if we included um, information about these. So please remember that we are a very diverse group. And for many LGBT people, homophobia and what's called transphobia are not the only forms of discrimination or stigma that are creating health disparities. For those of us who are not white, not able-bodied, are poor, undocumented, etc., the effects of discrimination are compounded, meaning added on, increased. Um, next, I want to cover some of the barriers LGBT people have in receiving competent and welcoming care. And there are several different issues that kind of collide here. These are things that, despite our greater need for health vigilance, keep us away from the health care system. In fact, as I will explain, LGBT people avoid the health and mental health systems in this country. First thing I want to talk about is the financial reason for avoiding health care. LGBT people have especially low rates of health insurance coverage. About one in four LGBT people lack insurance, with transgender people having the lowest rates of all. They're more than twice as likely to have no health insurance coverage. Some of the reasons covered here on this are covered here on the slide, meaning that as long as health insurance is tied to work and to marriage, LGBT people are a distinct disadvantage. The other problem for transgender people is that even when they are insured, their services will be limited to the procedures or cancer screenings that match the sex on their insurance card. So if you think of a transgender woman who is lucky enough to have insurance, and it will say female, she will not be covered for prostate screening, and odds are she has an intact prostate gland still. Oops, did it again. Um, discrimination, previous or feared, also keeps LGBT people from seeking health care. And while bias against LGBT people by providers is decreasing, it is absolutely still re documented repeatedly. Um, as an example of this, I have the results of a Harris Interactive poll from 2005. It was a large group of lesbians who were primarily white, middle class, and highly educated. And as you can see, the vast majority of them delayed or postponed care. Again, financial difficulties and previous negative experiences are most probably worse for LGBT people with fewer privileges. And this concern about treatment is reflected also in the experiences of LGBT people who work in health care. In a recent study on your list, one out of five LGBT nurses reported an unfriendly workplace. And of the others, many reported simply a barely tolerant workplace. So we enter the system wary, and often only when we have to. I'm sure most of you have your heart in the right place, but it doesn't mean that your forms or behavior accurately show me that. So I want to give you an example from my own life about a surgeon who meant well, 
who probably wanted to show me that she was comfortable with LGBT patients and put me at ease during a medical emergency that I had. After a night of um, no sleep a few years ago, I woke up and realized I probably needed my appendix out. I called my best friend who lives in the neighborhood and said, grab a cab, go up 6th Avenue, and meet me on the corner. We need to go to the ER. And my experience there was like perfect, like one of those like textbooks perfect things. It was fast, friendly, and within an hour and a half, a hip young surgeon was wheeling me down the hall to the operating room. And I think, trying to put me at ease, she asked, is that woman you're with your partner? No, I said, feeling a bit exposed. She's, she's my ex and my best friend. Oh, you lesbians are great at staying friends with your exes, she said. Now remember, at this point in my life, doing presentations like this one that I'm doing for you, I'm not just a lesbian professional, but I'm a professional lesbian. And I was uncomfortable. Remember, I was horizontal with a skimpy hospital gown on and I was about to be operated on. She was standing and dressed. And when she then rolled me into the operating room, she announced to the six or so people who were standing there waiting with masks on, she's here with her ex-partner. Aren't lesbians great how they stay friends with their exes? And I couldn't see their faces. I could only see their eyes. I didn't know who they were, how they felt about LGBT people. And I was very aware that I was about to be unconscious and they were going inside my body. Now, this was a simple laparoscopic appendectomy and it went fine. But it really showed me something. It showed me how scary it is to be out. And I imagined what it might have been like if I had a life-threatening illness, like cancer. Would I be willing, without some guarantee of safety, to tell my oncologist something that could make him or her think poorly of me? If I felt like my life was in that surgeon's or oncologist's hands, it would be really hard for me. Um, discrimination in healthcare is substantially worse for transgender people. I want to just go to the slide for a second and say it's worth saying out loud. One out of five trans people report being refused care, turned away by a provider simply because they were transgender. Um, the last bullet point is about uh, uh, documentary, a movie called Southern Comfort, and I think you can buy it on Amazon for $15, and I cannot encourage you to do so more strongly. It is a very moving um, documentary about how a transgender man with ovarian cancer was refused treatment by 19 people. Um, it's very moving, and it's really great, and I'm going to recommend it one more time. It, well, and also we found that it's not even just a movie now. <laughs> oh, right. It's yeah. hard to believe because it's an unbelievable tearjerker that it's been made into, I think it was a musical. Yeah, a musical off Broadway or something like that we just heard the other day. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure I can handle going to it. Um, so moving along here, most providers lack information about LGBT health needs. The good news is that nearly all of the medical schools surveyed in a study that you will get taught their students to ask patients if they, quote, have sex with men, women, or both, unquote, when they were obtaining a sexual history. But the teaching frequency of all the other LGBT topics was quite low. And without culturally competent doctors, LGBT people will continue to avoid the healthcare system, and when they do go, we'll be less able to get the treatment that we need and deserve. And those who hide might be denied important medical information and screening. And on that, I'm going to take some questions. But please remember, I feel like I speak as though LGBT people are one large homogeneous group, and I promise you we're not. And the level of discrimination and oppression we experience is based on some of the differences between us. So take it away, Doris. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, that is star then the number one. And we did have one thank you, Tanya, for speaking up with the first question from before. And um, so you're not entirely sure on the distinction between transsexuals versus transgender. Um, and I'm actually going to take the ED off that and just say transgender. Um, 
transgender is a term that was kind of created to unite a lot of different gender variant people. So transgender is kind of the umbrella term that would include a lot of people like transsexuals, drag queens, gender queer, um, uh, different things like that. Um, trans transsexual is a specific term about people who were uh, assigned male or female at birth and feel themselves to be the exact opposite. So transgender is kind of an umbrella term. Transsexual is the people who are the exact opposite. Transgender could refer to people who might consider themselves in the middle, have a bunch of different identity labels, things like that. I might have confused you because I said kind of transgender is the umbrella term is one use. Transgender also has another use to indicate people who might not be kind of in the middle of the football field or somewhere not in an end zone. Um, so that's just kind of a colloquial use that it also can mean people who are not um, either male identified or female identified, but somehow a blend of the two. Can I get so, that? Its main, its main term is as the umbrella label, and transsexual is the people who are the exact opposite of their assigned sex. Sorry, go ahead. Do you have a question? Um, I just wanted to add to what you oh. said and Sorry. say that some transgender people will choose to alter their bodies with surgery, or they may choose to take hormones, and some might do absolutely nothing, might not even change their hairdo but will identify as transgender and might um, begin using pronouns that match who they feel they are inside. And what I find in the trainings that I do is that people have trouble if somebody doesn't look male to them or male enough for them, they have trouble using male pronouns. And I just want to stress that I think everybody has the right to be called whatever they want he or she. I mean, when I, my real name isn't Liz, it's actually Elizabeth, but if I say call me Liz, nobody gives me a hard time and makes me prove that it's really my name. And I think if somebody who doesn't look like her name should be Charlotte says that she's Charlotte, please just call her Charlotte. Do we have any verbal questions coming up? Nothing else on the question and answer session there, but any verbal questions about all the stats or anything? There are no audio questions at this time. It looks like somebody might be typing here, though. Okay. Let's just give that person a second to get his question out. It puts a lot of pressure on him, right? He can do it. <laughs> And we're going to head into strategies next, so we're actually going to get down to, okay, what does this mean for your actual, you know, different types of environments? We're going to wait a couple more seconds for any more questions. All right, I think let's move on. And while we've got one who's being typed, we'll let them think it through because we've got another question section coming up. Um, okay. So, the, as you can see, as we talk to you about kind of like setting the stage, we really wanted to kind of show you just one simple uh, point that if you just take it, it out of here and remember nothing else in the world, this will really help you. That business as usual is not going to succeed with LGBT people in the healthcare arena. Unfortunately, many people come to us and say, oh, we treat everybody the same. But that won't work if the people coming to you do not presume that you are going to treat them the same and have reasonable uh, evidence that you might not treat them the same. And so they have concerns that they are not being given the uh, uh, same type of care. So they, LGBT people, we enter the healthcare system with mistrust. There's probably not one person I know who hasn't either had an adverse experience with a healthcare practitioner directed themselves or knows three other people who have. And, you know, this issue of associated trauma, if someone else in your community has had trauma, the stories go around. So that is also something that is just a very viable, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, something that really does create concerns and, you know, avoidance of healthcare and like that in people. So treating everybody the same won't work. If you're going to try and create a welcoming healthcare environment for LGBT people, you have to make sure that the people coming to your door know that you're going to be welcoming to them. 
because if you are silent about it, they have no reason to understand that you might not be the bigots who created that bad experience with their friends or with them or something like that. They have no reason to think you're welcoming. They probably don't have protections even, legal protections in your area, but if not, they just have too much history of poor experiences to presume that you're going to be welcoming. So the best thing you can do is to actually extend some way to show them that you're not business as usual. You are one of the healthcare facilities or practitioners who really is welcoming to this population. How do you do that? It's kind of complicated, right? Okay, we're going to talk um, about changes in a couple different levels. Individual changes, system changes, and then also, unfortunately, in order to really be effective, you usually are going to have to also stand up and say you're going to have to advocate for changes at some other level other than just what you can control. So we're going to run through those things. Um, first thing, as Liz had talked about with individual changes, obviously using respectful language. This can get kind of complicated also because, as she pointed, out, uh, like for example myself, right now my um, health care provider, trying to be respectful, changed my sex to male on all of my records there. And so as a result, I had three years of my, three months, sorry, of my health care insurance company denying every single record, that every single bill that was put in. Why? Who knows? But they just said, sorry, but that person is listed as one sex. You can't change it to the other because if so, we will just deny all the claims. So, you know, here you have an example of how we unfortunately sometimes need to keep our sex assigned at birth on our medical records specifically so that we can get that health care insurance and coverage for anything or is or for the biology body parts that we have. But that's not what we want to be referred to as and that's not what we want to actually have as our respected sex. So uh, that actually kind of creates challenges in a lot of medical record environments and you really have to um, figure out how you're going to deal with that. We want a situation, ideally, where someone may be able to have a legal name and a legal sex designation down on their health care records for insurance purposes, but that you're able to clearly refer to them by their chosen name and by their chosen sex designation. Um, and that often has to do with how your forms are and what they ask. We're going to get into that a little bit more. But... Um, also, like I said, mirroring patient's language. You want to be able to you know, talk back to them the same way that they're talking to you without any sense of visible discomfort. And uh, interestingly, one thing that was brought up that uh, hadn't put in another, another, um, another uh, training is that how you use pronouns is really important for LGBT people, for transgender people very specifically. And... It's not just that you, as Liz say, are a little bit more comfortable in using a pronoun that does not obviously strike you as what that person might be, you know, visually, but it's also that you are not uncomfortable using pronouns altogether. You know, one of the tricks that I use, honestly, truth be told, is that if I don't know what pronoun a person prefers to be referred to as, simply ask. That's all. I'm sorry, do you prefer he or she? Don't make it a big deal. They answer, you move on. But second of all, do not avoid pronouns if you're unsure. That can often be, I mean, I'm acutely aware of whether people are referring to me as he or she because I'm transgender. And so there have been too many conversations where, and you'd be surprised how often for some reason a pronoun comes up, even if you're talking directly one-on-one -on -one to per a person, where I can tell that the person is so uncomfortable referring to me as he that they actually then avoid all pronoun usage altogether. And all that does is just continue to remind me as the conversation gets more and more uncomfortable that they obviously are not comfortable with who I am. So don't avoid pronouns. Ask if you're unsure and use the pronouns they ask. And, you know, honestly, if you make a mistake, it's happened to all of us. Just don't worry about it. Dust your knees off. Get up, dust your knees off. Keep walking on. Don't make a big deal out of it. Don't go into a lot of excuses or reasons why you made the mistake. You just made a mistake. Move on. Um, so that's kind of something. And another trick, honestly, if you want to get a little better at separating the idea of what your mind thinks this person's sex is with what their pronoun is, just take someone you know. And for a day, practice talking with them in your mind using the opposite pronoun of what you usually use. Just do that a little bit more in your mind quietly. And it will become easier to then start to refer to people by a different pronoun than whatever your mind perceives that they might be. Because honestly, it really is just practice makes perfect related to a lot of this stuff. Um, and ensuring confidentiality. Um, obviously, 
Well, we actually do recommend that you ask LGBT on the intake forms because that's, among other things, one of the ways that you can actually show that your um, agency is welcoming. But with HIPAA requirements, we're all very well versed in what confidentiality is. But just to give you another example, like from my own experience, of how unexpected ways these types of things can come up. I, um, despite actually myself, I can train on how we shouldn't avoid healthcare. It doesn't mean I can achieve it. After avoiding healthcare for many years, I went to get well woman care, and at I was just about half a year ago that I was taking down the results from a pap smear to the lab, and as I showed up to the lab, the guy loudly said, "The only thing I don't understand," the lab agent said, "The only thing I don't understand is why you're bringing me a pap smear results." You know, it was a joke, but of course, kind of like Liz's example. It might have been funny in other circumstances, but with me, it was unfortunately a kind of poignant, uh, uh, you know, transgression as far as my HIPAA, vi- my HIPAA rights and violations and the fact that I was transgender was suddenly being announced to everybody in the lab. So, you know, as much as we think about confidentiality, consider how beyond HIPAA you are appropriate with um, awareness of the fact that someone might be LGBT or T. And then as with the example with my mother, you've got to include your patient's family in their choice of treatment and please be aggressive around trying to identify who their health care proxy is in case they're incapacitated, particularly in examples where they might be in emergency rooms or things like that. Um, and then maintain and use LGBT friendly referrals. You know, I've done a fair amount of work with um, providers, particularly for trans care in New York City. And despite the fact that it's probably one of the biggest trans populations in the country and there's the greatest number of providers, what I really learned from those providers was that you had to do your own research to find out if you needed to refer to someone else if they were going to be friendly and welcoming. And that meant that as the provider, they had to call the other provider and check it out and kind of, you know, scout out the territory in advance, as it were. And then even then, they still had to check in with their patient to find out if it really was the case because then there were stories of, oh, I called that person in advance. They said they were fine with it. But unfortunately, then, you know, your patient came back and said, no, they were actually pretty rude to me or discriminatory or things like that. So we would love to say that it's going to be very easy for you to find LGBT-friendly referrals. But the truth of the environment right now is if you're really dedicated to making sure your people have welcoming care and you need to do referrals, you're probably going to have to do legwork to make sure you're referring them to people who also treat them with due care. We do have a referral that you're going to get on another sheet, which is to the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association which lists um, online doctors in many different parts of the country, but there just aren't enough of them in specialty care areas for us to be confident about this. Um, And next, institutional changes. John, I see your question there. I can see why it took a long time to write, so how about if we get back to that at the next question section, if that's okay? And please feel free to give us more, too. Okay, as you can see from the things I was talking about already, many of the ways you influence people have to do with your institution. Many of you are the actual primary care providers. By the time they get to you, if they have experienced, we have experienced rude care anywhere else, then that means there's many different places when someone could have already turned away from your institution. Or someone in the communities who is avoiding health care because they don't think they have a friendly institution or provider near them. If you're not able to really show at the first place that someone could contact you that you're going to be welcoming, that's just more and more chances that someone could turn away. So how do you show this welcoming in different ways that are, that are easy and substantive? The simplest and most effective that we know of is to partner with a local LGBT organization because the local LGBT organizations have done a huge amount of work to gain the trust, obviously, of a large swath of the community, different overlapping communities. And think of different Interesting ways you can partner, you could put advertisements in local fundraising, um, you know, gala programs, different things like that. You can run a program maybe on LGBT health or on some health issue in, in you know, collaboration with one of your local health centers. You could, um, every year around um, June, most parts of the country have LGBT pride celebrations. Um, many of the health departments around the country are now realizing that that's a great place for them to go and have a booth at the pride celebration because that brings a whole different level of access and trust when there has been no relationships between those, you know, two entities, the community members and the health departments. Um, you can, you know, come up with something new. You can, you can create, you can put 
people from these organizations on your advisory committees. There's all sorts of ways to indicate a partnership with a local LGBT organization, and that will buy you an amount of trust that you just cannot afford to buy in any other way. So that's one of the best and smartest things. Second of all, definitely train all staff in LGBT cultural competence. Your receptionist has much more power than you have to alienate someone because you see them first before they see you usually. So you just got to make sure from the beginning of your organization on in, you're really making sure that the environment is welcoming. Another good way to do it is to post a non-discrimination policy very visibly in your welcoming area. And also, I like it when it actually also has the um, redress you know, procedures for complaints right there as well. You may not read non-discrimination policies because for you, they're old language. But I don't think I've yet experienced one that I don't stop and read to see if sexual orientation and particularly gender identity are in the middle of them. So it's also a beautiful way where... You know, it doesn't, it's not obtrusive whatsoever, but for the LGBT people, it kind of stands out like a neon sign. They will read it. Um, another thing, actually, um, we talk about language. Oh, under forms down here. We're going to talk about that again, under forms. Okay. Include LGBT people in the patient bill of rights, visitation policies, and health care proxy efforts. As we kind of had already talked about, there is an organization that um, Human Rights Campaign and the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association have jointly come together to create a health care equality index, which actually gauges the wealth becomingness of different hospitals and, and health entities. And these are some of the things they specifically look for. So, um, you know, do you have LGBT people explicitly stated in these different areas? Because, again, if we're not stated, it doesn't mean we're included. Another easy thing you can do, make sure you've got LGBT staff. This is all cultural competency. It's one of the, you know, standards of it. If you have LGBT staff, that's the fastest and easiest way for you to show that you're welcoming and also to get a continual level of input to make sure your policies really are effective. And make sure that you provide supportive dis policies for those staff, non-discrimination in your hiring for those staff, um, different things like that. If you're in one of those states that's white, that is white, it's not presumed. So make sure that, you know, you can create an LGBT employee group if your organization is large enough. All of those sorts of things will help create an environment where they feel welcome. Definitely, if you have community advisory boards, and, you know, most agencies would, make sure that you have LGBT people on them. They can provide you with a level of local knowledge that just cannot be duplicated in a slideshow that, you know, talks about all parts of the country. You know, in your area, you might have an LGBT choir that's a big deal, so, you know, co-sponsoring something with a choir can really help show that you're welcoming the community members. Or maybe you have a large religious organization. Um, or maybe it's the equality organization that's the biggest place where people congregate. We can't tell you from here, but those local people in your advisor committee can absolutely tell you very easily. Also include targeted outreach to the LGBT communities. As you can kind of see, general uh, media does not necessarily reach us and speak to us. So that's why you've got to have targeted outreach. And under forms, as we talked about a little bit already, you have to make sure that you don't have things like, is your sex male or female? That doesn't allow any place for me to talk to you about how I'm transgender. Uh, who, what is your spouse's name or information? Is your next of kin, uh, wife, husband? All of those things are alienating language. We actually recommend forms that have LGBT in them and that ask about them, but also avoid the things that presume that you're heterosexual, that you're heterosexual and presume that you're allowed to legally marry. The forms are a great example of how you can, again, indicate welcoming, but one thing I would recommend is if they haven't seen anything else indicating welcoming, it's really smart to put that non-discrimination statement before the, before the form at the very top. The people who won't, aren't affected by it won't read it, but the people who are affected by it will see it as a way to show welcoming. Mentioned how the Healthcare Quality Index is um, a way to gauge these things. We have the site there, and this is a way also you can get rank yourself on this, and then that information will be published, and that way is another way to just show to everybody that you're welcoming. We are running a little behind, so I'm just going to go a little fast to make sure I've got time for more questions. As you can see, in most environments, you can't just change your own behavior. You have to change your environment, otherwise people won't be able to get to you to see that you're even welcoming in the first place. So this usually means that someone has to speak up and say, we need to change our forms, we need to put things up in the waiting room, we need to do this kind of advertising or partnership with local groups. Um, you know, we really encourage you that if you really want to be a provider that's welcoming, you're probably going to have to take a little bit of this advocacy role too and not just change your own practices. Use the information 
here, you know, uh, ask us for more information, whatever you need. You usually have to educate your management on why these things are important. And one thing I mentioned there is as changes unfold, if your management is educated, it can really help them just roll past individual complaints. For a lot of these things like information on forms and stuff like that, the general population is really tolerant of them. But it is susceptible to single person individual complaints, which is why it's good to educate the management so that they can just fly by that stuff without it actually. Um, we've had some bad experiences where, you know, like people have complained about LGBT being on surveys and then it shuts down the survey until you can go back and educate those policymakers and they reopen it up because they understand why it's important. Okay. Um, I'm going to actually stop now for John's stuff, too. Recently, our state uh, health department Can applied benefits to gay yeah. patient. Sorry, yeah? I think we should just finish up the last part and then take all the questions. Fine. All right. I'll agree then. Okay. Thank you. Resources and um, tools. Could I just uh, I'll hands off my slides? Sorry, ma'am. Okay. I'm going to speak a bit about resources that are available for increasing the cultural competence of the staff in the facilities where you work. So as Scout was saying before, you often will have to be or somebody has to be the single advocate who pushes this forward or a committee that does. Um, but there are some tools and resources to help you. Um, and we understand that there are often limitations of time or budget or more unfortunately and more often limitations of commitment from top administrators and facilities. So what we've done in this slide is show you some options and ranking them in terms of effectiveness. Ideally, for example, there's a live trainer, uh, an LGBT trainer, in fact, a professional LGBT trainer. The training is mandatory for all staff, and it's implemented immediately upon hiring. It's part of orientation so that no one ever starts working until they're trained. And as cultural competence training is important, but not unfortunately sufficient, technical assistance is available to help with other changes like forms, non-discrimination policies, et cetera. Um, the other options listed here are less comprehensive and therefore um, less powerful, but even the worst one we listed online or a webinar like this at least comes under the category of good. Um, the list of organizations here are places that offer live trainings where you can bring somebody into your facility to um, train your staff or train the trainers so that a group of you can then train the rest of the staff. Most of these are organizations. This should be on the handout too. Right, Scout? Yes. Okay, well, good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The only individual here is Samuel Lurie, who is a great transgender presenter. Um, but you will have all of this information. Less good, of course, would be a self-directed training, and this list of organizations offers self-directed trainings. Um, and now this is the uh, cultural competence training that my organization has put together called Reexamining LGBT Healthcare, and I want to tell you a little about ours. It was designed originally for the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, which is the largest municipal hospital system in the country with 39,000 employees, or nearly 39,000. This followed by several years a report by the Public Advocate's Office that said that the treatment of LGBT people in city facilities was uneven and made many recommendations. And after years of silence, some money was coughed up to design LGBT cultural competence. But it is the only group, LGBT people, for whom everybody is trained in cultural competence. We were asked to design two different a curricula, a 15 minute and a one hour. But we've now redesigned it. It includes a 10 minute video and you can see a three minute excerpt of that on our website which is at the bottom of the slide. So we're trying to now make it easy for other facilities to become, to train everybody in cultural competence. So it's out of the box ready but we can also customize it. And the amazing thing, my organization does the train the trainers workshop once a month to keep training more people to train the rest of the 39,000. And it's amazing to be training the guards and the intake workers and everybody because, as Scout said, by the time you see your LGBT culturally competent healthcare provider, you've already had four experiences with other staff. And 
if we enter wary, we're going to be more so if any one of those four experiences isn't good. Or, or you can leave. leave. <laughs> Or just leave. I mean, there's something in our video about somebody who left, who was not, was called by the name on the health insurance, not the name that she signed in with, and ultimately she just gave up and left. So I am a very strong proponent of training all staff, because just the providers knowing how to be different is not going to bring our people into health care. And given the disparities that we have, we need it. So thank you. And um, before Scout takes the questions, um, this is just a reminder that we are available to answer questions even after this and to help collaborate with you to offer more culturally competent care to the LGBT patients and clients where you work. So, Absolutely. Scott, did you want to take one of those questions? I interrupted you. No, no, that's just fine. Also, before people, um, like in case people jump off before they do, there's also going to be an evaluation. Please, please give us feedback there. Okay, so there was one question on um, what do you do with a State Department of Health decline benefits to gay patient who met poverty guidelines when you include this partner, but DHS said you couldn't because they did not have the option of legally marrying, so they were not um, legal entities. Sadly, um, I actually think that this is one of the situations that's frustrating that I don't have a good approach to appeal it, unless you happen to be in one of those states where there's no um, discrimination. So look back. I don't know what state you're in, John, but if you are, it might be able to be that you can appeal it through that route. But unfortunately, that just might be one of the situations where we use the example as something else that really needs to be changed. Um, Cecilia, grew up black in Utah and always took note of the non-discrimination clause. Excellent. I guess you're right. I'm not the only one who's reading it. It mentioned the slide with a map that states in white it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. I wonder if you can give some examples of what this means because I always saw LGBT people included in the non-discrimination clause in my state. Also, are many of the mandates federal mandates and not expected state to state? Actually, sadly, we've tried to put federal non-discrimination, you know, as I'm sure you know, uh, Cecilia, in order to be a protected category under non-discrimination, you have to fight to get your category added. We have tried to fight to get this, to get sexual orientation and gender identity added to the national clauses with no success. Uh, that legislation is called the Employment Non-Discrimination uh, um, Act, and it has never passed. Um, and I can't explain why. So it is right now up to each of the jurisdictions. And unfortunately, the way this usually works, uh, we, as Liz reviewed some of that information around transgender health disparities, is that the people who are most visibly uh, queer or transgender or something like that get a lot of discrimination, uh, sometimes an hor absolutely horrific amount of discrimination. So it's very common, as I quote one of the big uh, transgender doctors in New York City, transgender people are last hired and first fired. So, um, you know, there's you know, a huge amount of uh, uh, employment discrimination that happens. I know a lot of transgender people that have a very hard time finding places to live because people won't uh, rent to them. So for people who are more visibly variant of some nature, this discrimination is a daily fact of their lives. Uh, for people who can pass better as being straight or as being, you know, gender concordant, obviously you get less of it. And so that just talks to you about how the stigma kind of is acting itself out in our, in our society. Um, and with that, let me throw it open again for also the Star One people to see if we have a verbal question or to keep writing in the chat box like everybody has been here if there's any other questions. You do have an audio question from the line of David. Yes, I love it. Go, David. No? Is that not the right person? David, um, your last name and last initial is A. Your line is open. I'm sorry. My question was uh, for <laughs> earlier, but uh, um, the only issue that I've had uh, as far as uh, has been with uh, a les lesbian uh, patients, um, as far as like their follow up with their GYN. <laughs> Um, some of them are not, you know, they're not sexually active with men, so they, for some reason they have the idea that they don't have to have GYN care. Um, I was just wanted to know what would be the best approach to getting them, you know, uh, GYN care. 
that's pretty much it. Liz, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, I would go back to one of the suggestions that Scout said, which is partnering with an LGBT organization. That you're right, many lesbians do not know that they need regular GYN care. Um, heterosexual women often go regularly because they need birth control, but it doesn't mean that lesbians are not vulnerable to um, cervical cancer, for example. So an outreach campaign um, with one of your local LGBT organizations would be great, where maybe you could work together to um, have some targeted materials or a special day, for example, that would be, you know, lesbian uh, GYN day. You could set aside a morning or, um, I know like mammogram fans, for example, sometimes go to LGBT organizations and mobile mammogram fans, obviously, and they're not, not everybody can use them, but you need to reach out specifically to the population you're trying to reach and partnering with an organization that has the population's respect um, would be helpful. Also, getting those materials, like you know, Liz's shop, the network for uh, National LGBT Cancer Network, has educational materials around cancer screenings for LGBT and T folks. You know, having materials like that in in house, and we can um, try and give some other resources. As uh, we're finishing the resource list that we're going to give to you after this too, to make sure you have some other resources for physical pamphlets, things like that. Because you know, if they see something from some organization they already know about that you can just hand them, it'll help just reframe their thinking about it. Absolutely. Absolutely, and the, um, we have palm cards that, again, are targeted. They're designed to be appealing to LGBT people, and they're about cancer screenings, and we have one for lesbians and transgender guys about um, ovarian cancer. And if anybody would like a bunch of these for their facility, just write to me at info at cancer-network.org and tell me where to send them, and I'll send them out. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Any other verbal questions, or we've got some coming up like on chat? Again, if you'd like to ask a question, press star 1. Yeah, so I see, Cecilia, that you were saying you had a similar problem to David's. I think there's a lot of outreach and education that we have to do. Right, which and in some cases was, like, propagated by providers, too, and, you know, a lot of, you know, the popular information out there was a little misleading, too, so. Right, but I think when you couple that with low um, health insurance coverage rates and a mistrust of the healthcare care system, thinking you don't have to go just fits really well. And we have to counter that because we have to be hypervigilant about care of our bodies. Yeah. We do have Cecilia uh, in queue for an audio question. Great. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. This is probably my last question. I've, last, I've asked a lot. Um, Great. Okay. I have kind of a medical legal question. Um, anytime a woman of childbearing age comes and complains of abdominal pain, we're encouraged as medical professionals to get a pregnancy test. I haven't really known how to approach it without offending someone when they tell me, you know, I'm, I'm not sexually active with males. When a female tells me I'm not sexually active with males, I know I'm not pregnant. But for me, legally, I'd like to have it documented in a chart. Um, so I feel like sometimes I've offended patients. That you've asked them around the test? Or that yeah. I'm, I'm like, well, really, I need to write it down that it's negative. <laughs> so I think it's fine that you can say, look, the protocol is if you've got abdominal pain and we're supposed to, you know, ask you or encourage you to get a pregnancy test. So... I mean, you can just say, I'm not sure this is anything that applies to you, but I want to make sure we step through the protocol in case it does. Okay. So you've got to be careful about this to presume it does apply. I'm sorry? You've just got to be careful to presume it does apply because so often that's been one of the classic things. We insist you've got to go on birth control pills, and they keep insisting, no, actually, I'm a lesbian. I assure you the immaculate conception is not going to happen here. You know, that's right. famous, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to add that um, also, just to keep it complicated, once you know that somebody identifies as a lesbian, it doesn't mean that she never has sex with men. Right, exactly. And that's part of the reason why I still push for it. It's, it's almost like with teenagers, you'll ask them, oh, are you sexually active? They say, no, you do a pregnancy test, they're pregnant. Okay, you know, it's like <laughs> I trust people, but sometimes there's situations that we're not 
fully informed yeah. on. Because <laughs> as long as you don't insist a situation that they say doesn't apply to them really must, you're usually pretty safe. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And I think with that, um, and Jamila, you had asked for resources for the Caribbean. We will look. I'm not sure if they exist. We're struggling to get resources from most of the mainland United States right now. So um, we'll find out if we can find anything for that. How's that? And um, with that, I think uh, we've got, well, you know, uh, we've got, I think, the evaluation to put up. We encourage you to please fill that out. Give us feedback. Be honest. We promise we won't ca we won't look at your names or anything like that. Help us make this better. And um, feel free to contact us more. Liz, anything else? No, I just want to um, underline that we're available after this to answer any questions or help guide you towards resources. Great. Okay, with that, we turn it back over to the to the HRSA folk. Thanks, Susan Scout. We really appreciate you taking your time to um, join us this evening and share all this great information and resources um, with our clinicians. And we hope that you found um, some of the information that they shared uh, beneficial and that it prompted you to um, be proactive in your own community. Um, again, we encourage you to fill out the evaluation. and. Um, we're excited to bring you future um, NHSC webinars. And so with that, I will, again, just want to say thank you to Liz and Scout, and have a great evening. Thank you all very much. Good luck, and um, go change the world. And this does conclude today's conference call. You may now disconnect.